messing up your pipes. Um, and I don't use gravel. I don't use gravel around the pipes, but I use wood chips around the pipes to just keep the air flowing. Um, I don't just pack it with compost. I like to keep it very airy and uh, loose. So I'll make that trench about a foot wide for a four inch pipe. Again, lay my pipe in there and lay the wood chips in there and I'm good to go. Even though I can use a backhoe on my compost pile and my guys get so bugged, I usually make them use a pitchfork and wheelbarrows. I just don't want the compaction and, um, you know, I'm not a massive composting site. Like I say, my compost pile is like half as big as this room, so every little bit of it is precious to me, and I use it for brewing. So, so I don't want I don't want my pile getting mashed by backup tires. Um, the aeration frequency, like I had a static pile and it wasn't building temperature, and I could not figure out what's wrong. All of a sudden, this Peter Moon is running a, a static compost seminar out in Washington, out in, um, what's the capital of Washington? Seattle. Olympia is the capital. Right, okay. It was out, yeah, outside of Olympia. And um, we flew out there, and he was talking about this aeration frequency. And um, I was only doing it one cycle an hour. As soon as I raised it to three an hour, got back, boom, my pile went to 131 degrees within a day, within 24 hours. So I've been running these, these three one-minute cycles ever since then, and it's been working out great for me. Uh, it's a duration of air between two and seven and a half minutes per cycle. You know, you, know, you want some breaks in between there. The aeration speeds up this decomposition process and maintains the temperature and the moisture. <laughs> there's no, there's really no noticeable odor. I don't see a problem with animals. Uh, I can, I can start a batch and have it in 45 days, pretty much ready to go into the mature pile. It's incredible how fast it breaks the stuff down. And um, there's a lot of biology in this compost. I mean, I am not a good enough scientist to look at just compost and see biology. But when I brew it, and I put it in my brewers for 24 hours to 30 hours, then I see the life like crazy under the microscope. I forgot to set it up for today, but I'll set it up later. And uh, it's just a simple microscope. Uh, I think I paid about under $300 for it. Barry also has a source for microscopes where it, when you buy the microscope, the guy also sells you all photographs of what you'll see under there so that you can identify. That's my biggest thing is um, I see so much life under my microscope, but I have a hard time identifying these little microscopic guys. Like I say, 45 to 60 days, I have a pretty mature compost, but I still leave it on another pile for another 60 days, just to mature. Why is there not human pathogens in properly made compost? It's, it's the heat. It, the heat kills the, um, the heat kills the bad bacteria, fungi, and viruses. But the good, the good microbes can take a higher heat than the pathogens. Just nature is just unbelievable how it how it can do these processes. Just like Barry said with the nematodes, being able to pick out the, the bad nematodes, the fungi can pick out the bad ones. Um, nature has just come up with this way. At 131 degrees, salmonella and E. coli are gone but yet the beneficials are there. So it's 131 for three days, you see it right there. You could go up to 150 degrees for two days or 165 degrees for 24 hours. You don't want to go higher than 165 degrees. It's going to, you know, you're going to use all the oxygen in your pile. It's going to become anaerobic. It's just too hot. 
Uh, that's why I love the static system. It just keeps those temperatures down. Um, with my static system, I've never had a temperature over about 148 degrees. It's about the maximum I've got in my piles. And it's so much fun. It's like, you know, I used to be out there spraying pesticides every day. I hated what I did. I didn't like my guys being out there. I just love what I do now. It's so much fun. You know, the guys love it. Um, it's just a blast. Every day is an adventure. These are some um, CNN ratios of some common materials to help you. You want to get about a 30 to 1, 30 carbon to 1 nitrogen. Um, you can see grass clippings are about 12 to 15. You know, the lower the number, the higher the nitrogen source. And fresh leaves are 40. So, so mixing those two together, you get about your, your 30 to 1 um, ratio that you need. One thing up top, you're going to see poultry manure, cow manure, and horse manure. I use manureless compost. I don't get involved with manures just for the E. coli problem. So that's why I use produce, grass clippings, and leaves, and newspaper. Um, you know, I don't get involved in manure composting. Uh, you can do it. You know, you just maintain temperature and have confidence you can do it. But it's just, it's a risk like Roy talked about this morning that I don't want to deal with, so I do manureless composting. I'm sure there's organisms in that manure that I can't get without it. I was out, when I was out in um, Washington at the composting class, they were throwing whole pigs into the compost pile. And seven days later, there wasn't a bone left. Like it just, the heat just broke it right down. They had uh, horse farmers in there with these composting systems. It was incredible. Here's the proper range, 30 to 1. Can, uh, you can achieve it by adjusting your feedstock materials. Uh, the grass clippings with the leaves gives you 31. Now, the, see, the manures are so, so intensely, have lo the low numbers, you know, there's so, so much nitrogen in there that you, you have to be careful. I mean, where is it? Horse manure by itself is ideal for composting. For some reason, horse manure doesn't need the mixing. It can just decompose on its own if you're monitoring temperature in the leaves. But mix it with the sawdust, you know, that ratio would be too high and the compost, uh, compost wouldn't be as good. CO2 is created by this composting process. Uh, so the amount of carbon in the compost decreases. Horse manure with no bedding may start out, right, at a good C to N ratio. But if you add that straw and the, the, the bedding material, it, it might drop that ratio down and again, the compost would be ineffective. So, um, again, I'm having a lot of fun with composting. Uh, it's a blast. I have a little bit of room. I, own, I have a two-acre house in Franklin Lakes. I'm doing backyard composting. I'm always looking for a little place to set up another one of these, these static systems. But um, I don't have enough compost to top dress with. So I've had to go out and Barry's helped me get some compost sources, and that's always been a challenge to get quality compost. Um, most of the town's leaf dump is, I'm going to just back up a little step. When you look at compost, good compost should be brown. There's a color test that you can tell for good compost. Good compost should be the color of a 70% chocolate bar. That's like a dark brown. If it's black, the compost has gone anaerobic and it's just been too hot and it's just like 
I guess it's got some organic matter in it, but it does not have active biology in it. So it's black. Or it's and another thing about compost and anything with organics, if it smells bad, it is bad. I mean, you know, if it smells ammonia or, or, or something else, you know, something went wrong. You, you, you built up too much heat, so always be smelling and, and, and looking at color, you know, it, it all makes a difference. Um, Mike, are you all. saying that these gigantic recycling places that have these mountainous piles are probably overcooked? They probably are. I, I'm not going to say every one is bad or anything, but most of them are. They're not turning them enough, you know, too much heat's building up. Mm -hmm. I've been at compost facilities where there was actually compost fires, like got so hot inside those piles you can see them smoking and they actually can start fires. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a place that's not testing their compost, like I, I go to a local farm and he's like, I don't test my compost, you want it or not, you know, and uh, I, I you know, that's mostly their attitude, you know. And you know, I don't I don't know. I guess for getting organic matter into the ground, well you do take a chance on it not being finished, number one, and it could be yellowing. So anything that you do buy, you really need to test on your own lawn or something first before you start doing it on a large scale. But um, you know, like I said, they're paying a lot of money for good compost. I've been paying 50, 60 bucks a yard plus a couple hundred dollars delivery. But I've been top dressing, putting that three eighths to a quarter inch to three eighths inch layer down, building up my organic matter, using, um, I'm back to granular lime. You know, the high cal limes that you buy are good and they adjust the pH for a while but they're only a temporary fix, so um, that's, that's another area we'll talk a little bit about later. I don't know if you can build soil pH with the high cal limes and get it to six and a half to seven, then introduce your biology and will it keep it at six and a half to seven, or does it drop down like it naturally wants to do without biology? So that's an area that we really need some uh, research and development on. Nobody really knows that answer. But, um, but the granular lime as opposed to the magic cows or whatever, you know, um, seem to give a better long-term soil adjustment. Do you have to use a lot of that, don't you? You do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it, it is a little bit of a process. You can't just bring your lawn from a five to a seven in one shot. Even that process will yellow it. You have to take it up in increments. Mm -hmm. But um, as long as you're going in that right direction, you know, um, I'm testing the soils two to three times a year with the pH meter. I can't believe how many lawns up in northern New Jersey are like five, five point five, just really acidic, you know. And um, I did lawn apps for 15 years and I, like never did soil testing. And now that I'm looking back, I'm like, how did I do it? I just dumped bags down. You know, um, <coughs> it's a whole different approach. It's a, an approach that makes sense. And, you know, I love it. I just love having a little science behind what I do and having the people like Bill that's been in the back moderating as well too that really know the science that can teach us these things that us practitioners can go out and put these concepts into practice and do the ecological responsible thing for our communities, our workers, ourselves, our schools, our kids. It's just a great thing. Um, I only have this Econo Lawn applicator up here because that's what I have and I didn't know the other kinds of brands and I'll show you a picture of it later but Barry showed another one that works by the same way it has a spinner and it's a belt driven thing and the compost flies out um, I spent I spent almost six thousand dollars for mine this year with a double spinner on it 
and um, I do do a lot of larger athletic fields, so I usually have mine and I rent two other ones for a hundred bucks a day. And on an athletic field, three is a perfect amount. You fly on the fields and uh, like on an athletic field, we'll spread between 50 and 75 yards of compost. Is that a paper in the price? Yes, uh, I told you that. Oh, you did? What does it say, 50000 Yeah. Oh, it's supposed to be $5,999. You got a deal on it. Thank you. <laughs> the other 49000 was Barry's commission. <laughs> I want to get into these uh, pull-behind tractor mounts, because you're paying whatever. How much for the motor? Um, you know, it's almost like uh, the farmers have them, manure, manure pullers. I want to look into those and see how those work. That's going to be my next kind of uh, investment or, or at least investigation. But uh, until I had the applicator, I just used the wheelbarrow with spring rakes. Just flew it out with the, you know, on residential properties, 10,000 square feet, half a day, a couple guys, and you top aerate top dress a lawn. It's a great money revenue bringer into the company. You combine that with uh, seeding, overseeding, because in organics we, we seed, seed, seed. That's, you know, we cover every inch of that soil with seed, no bare spots. Just a quick sideline. I am not using a pre-emergent crabgrass control at this time. I am just sticking with the seeding. Um, in the spring, there's so many bare spots, like I can't use corn gluten because weeds are going to come in anyway and it's so expensive. So um, I've been trying to get my pH right, my organic matter between 5 and 7%, cut 3 inches high, never let the guy scalp it. There's classes. One of, the, one of the guys on the board actually welds his blades at three inch because his workers keep wanting to drop those blades down and he welds them, I love that. But um, proper cultural methods, and, and I don't get any more crabgrass than I do on guys that are using like dimensions, so. But not this year, but last year I did get burned with it. I got a lot of crabgrass last year, but I think even guys that were using pre-emergence yeah. got crabgrass last year. Yeah, 2013. Yeah. yeah, it was bad. Anyway, um, quarter to three inch thick, never a half inch thick. That's too much. You'll do damage. And um, so at that point now I switch over to my real passion, which is brewing compost tea. Uh, I took my first class, again, it was Chip Osborne, and um, he was talking about compost tea products, bugs in a jug versus brewing tea, and he really um, got my passion going with the brewing. Um, I thought, I'll never use those bugs in a jug, but... Um, I've actually incorporated a product of Barry's, not that we're pushing products here, but it's a product that has dormant biology in it, and I'm going to add it to my tea this year because some of the microorganisms that are listed on there, I just don't really know if my teas have it or not, and it's so inexpensive, like $75 does 500 gallons, so I'm, I'm dumping it in, in my tea. I apply tea twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. I, I brewed 40,000 gallons of compost tea last year, uh, which is a lot of tea. I have uh, these 250-gallon brewers. I have two of them side by side, so I could brew 500 gallons of tea at a time. And um, in the very beginning of compost tea, they thought compost tea was like savior of everything. It's, it's really just another tool in the toolbox and it's a darn good tool, but um, I put my tea down straight on, on residential properties. I don't cut it with water. Um, I really give them their money's worth and I, I charge a very inexpensive price compared to other people for compost teas. My passion is to get 
organics down around the same price and be competitive like with a true green. If I could be cost neutral with this business, I, I really feel like we could run to the races with it. So, um, you know, that's, that's try where my passion is, trying to get the prices to be in line with the chemical companies. But just, just remember that True Green loses money. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yes. That, that is true. I just was on organic on a project. We have a little time. Um, I do the sports fields for Point Pleasant, and True Green was doing the sports fields before I was in there. They came in with a price so cheap to get him back that um, he's going back to, to like not organic and I'm sick. He was at the class last month and didn't listen to this when you bounce between commercial fertilizers back and forth. It's, it's you know, you want to commit to one or the other. You can't be flip-flopping. But um, I'm nauseous over it. And True Green, he's like, I can't believe that True Green's giving me a second free feeding. I'm like, yeah, dude, because he knows you're going to get fungus, and then he's going to get you for fungus, you know. Like, yeah, he's definitely telling you another feeding, you know. Um, setting you right up for failure. But, but um, enough bandstanding on that. <laughs> Back to the compost tea. <laughs> Um, again, it's my passion, brew and tea, to look, under, to look under the microscope and see this active biology is like the coolest thing you'll ever do. It's very, it's, it's easy to do. Barry said there's a lot of brown water out there, so I, I highly encourage you to get a microscope. They're a couple hundred dollars and begin to look at everything under there. Uh, you start out at a 10 to 1 magnitude. Well, actually, it's 100 to 1. Then you go to 40 to 1, which is 400. And then you go up, You can go up to 1,000. But at this 400 to 1, you see all the, just like Barry was showing you on the YouTube, you see all that biology swimming around. And um, you'll know right away. I was brewing fantastic tea all year. And then all of a sudden, around Labor Day, there was no biology in the water. I mean, it just went bad. It went, there was no life in anything. We're brewing batches. I'm like yelling at my guys. What are we doing wrong? You know. Um, and then I'll go through some of the things that can go wrong. But it, it turned out that the worm castings had gone stale. I bought worm castings in the spring in these plastic bags that are supposedly breathable. I didn't cut the bags open. They sat for three months and they just, you know, the life left it. So um, if I buy worm castings now, I immediately open all the bags and lay them out. You know, I don't stack anything. And a lot of worm castings come in five gallon tubs. I'll take the top right off and let that air circulate and just, you know. So um, again, it's an aerobic process. You need air. It's living things. So compost tea is one of the foundations of a, a complete organic program. Now, the compost that we talked about and in the soil food web the compost is going to bring your organic matter up to the 5 to 7 percent, okay? The compost tea is not going to do anything for the organic matter, but it's going to be able to infuse that, that organic matter with the biology, is what you're inoculating that biology. Now that you have the pH right, and now that you have your organic matter right, you have a perfect place for this biology to live, and um, that's where you're laying in your compost teas, and you're addressing that biology in the soil. Um, you know, we use compost tea. There are some bottled products that you can use until you get your brewer system set up that seem to be pretty good. There's inoculants that you can add to your compost tea. <coughs> I use seaweed, I use kelp, and um, humates, I use humic acid. I always have a bag of humic acid. 
last year I was dechlorinating my water with like the pond dechlorinator, but humic acid does a great job. Hmm. Um, chlorine can actually bubble right off. If you put your air on in your brewers and let it go 24 hours, it'll blow the chlorine off. But now they're adding chloramine to the water supply. Not all places, like up by us, United Water does not add chloramine. And the humic acid should blow that off. Um, you know, it has, it has for me. Um, some people have asked me to prove it. And I, well, only by brewing tea and seeing if the biology is there or mm -hmm. under the scope is it just brown water, you know, um, or do you see all that active biology yeah. running around? That's what I've had to do because I'm not a scientist to really know. I mean, um, this slide, this slide was actually taken from um, Dr. Dr. Elaine Ingham's presentation and a guy named Bruce Elliott. And they were some of the original soil pioneers. Bruce Elliott runs a company, Sustainable Agricultural Products. Is that the name of the bar? Do you know? Sustain Sustainable Agricultural Technologies. And they sell brewers and Vortex systems. Um, but, but the compost tea, when you spray the compost tea on the leaves, that actually those, that bacteria and the fungi is, is living and growing right on the leaf surface and it's out-competing disease organisms. Um, it's also producing, it's, it's giving the plant the biology that it needs to produce these plant growth hormones and it's giving the soils the, the the biology to mineralize these these nutrients into a form that can be taken up by the plants. Uh, as Barry was talking about before, nitrogen in the soil is not, it's, um, I'm not a chemist, so the, you know, the ammonia and the, the nitrates and, and I don't know how to explain that yet, but um, I do know that the tea provides the, the organisms that are necessary to complete that process. Yes, Pat? Um, just one thing I always make sure I point out is um, when you're, like Mike was talking about spreading uh, leaves and getting the biology on the leaf surface, you got to be careful that you're not and claims that it has pesticide properties. Yeah. Because if you do, then you're going to be in trouble with the law. Yeah. All I try to say is it's, it's competing with the disease organisms, you know, and um, as you have seen, nature has put into place some systems and checks where things, the good things, can actually outcompete those disease organisms in a healthy ecosystem. Um, the benefits of tea, they create biologically active soils with the fungi and the bacteria. The health and the quality and the vigor of the plants are improved. Um, it helps even with that cation exchange capacity um, to retain nutrients and improve soil structure. Uh, Nutrient retention is improved. It, it, the oxygen diffusion and the disease suppression. I'm not going to make claims on it, but um, you know, by spraying that bacteria and the fungi in there, and they're getting active, it's creating that pore spaces that the plants need, and it's just creating a great system. I'm not going to. I'm going to be careful about making too many claims that it's the magic elixir. I just wanted to talk a minute about the mycorrhizal inoculants. I know Bill was speaking and sharing about it this morning. Um, I was doing these fields in Bergen Community. I sent a soil sample off to the soil food web and it said we had really no mycorrhiza in the soil. Um, 
I, I sprayed one application of tea at that time, so we're just kind of doing a baseline. It was in the fall. I did a, um, I did a core aeration. Then I, I did my compost tea, but I added an endo mycorrhiza packet into my 250 gallon brew. One, one package, it was like 60 bucks, did, did 250 gallons. Sprayed the 500 gallons on the tea, and then um, Hugh did a surprise test on me in the winter. I didn't even know it, but 